stage. He said, I'm a, a designer, an entrepreneur, a dreamer. I called and I said, it's time. And the reason why I'm saying it's time is because it's time for a change. I've been watching cars and I've seen, like I said, I've got a passion for those big V8 engines, but there's a time for a change to electric. It's time to move on to a new technology. I'm going to go back to about 2008. In 2008, I was sitting on the beach and gas prices were rising and I was on vacation and I was reading a magazine and I came across an article about this guy out in California that was building sports cars and he was putting laptop batteries in it. He called it the Tesla Roadster. And I was reading about it and it was going to be about $120,000. And I'm like, you know what? I, I think I can build uh, an electric car for less than that. He's got a really cool car. I, as a kid, I had always raced radio controlled cars, electric ones. So I knew the electronics basically about what went into them. And I also knew they were really fast. A lot of torque on an electric motor. So I'm sitting there on the beach and I'm going through eBay with my iPhone and I come across this uh, thing called a 1968 Fiberfab Valkyrie kit car. It's a replica of a Ford GT40. Price is right, so I bid 500 bucks. Well, the next morning, I woke up and uh, found that I had won this car. <laughs> I then spent the rest of the week trying to figure out what exactly I was going to tell my wife as to what I was going to do with this car. <laughs> anyway, I took this car, I got this car, we took it home, I took out the gas engine from it, and I got on the internet. It was the first thing I did. And I started going through the internet. And I'm like, you know, you got to find out some information on how I'm going to do this. Well. What I found very quickly is that I wasn't the only guy out there that was thinking the same thing. In fact, there were a lot of guys that have been thinking the same thing way before I did. And they're out there doing all kinds of cool stuff, but what's more important is they're actually sharing the stuff on the internet. There was one thing, this one guy I came across that took a 1972 Datsun. I mean, this is like, like the last car you can think of as a race car, okay? <laughs> and he stuck an electric motor in it and batteries and called it the white zombie. And he was out there blowing the doors off of big muscle cars. It's so like he's coming up against Camaros, Mustangs, and Corvettes, and he's like leaving them in the dust on the drag strip. I actually got the chance to meet uh, John Wayland, who uh, made the white zombie, a great guy, and he's still doing it. He's still blowing the doors off of other cars. I don't know if anybody here is into, electric, or into drag racing, but doing a 10.24 is really incredible. There are cars out there now, electric cars, that are doing it in the eights. But anyway, one of the things that I found is I wasn't alone. There's a lot of stuff out there. And in fact, there was an organization called the uh, Electric Auto Association. And the really cool thing is I found that there was actually one that was meeting in Boca Raton, Florida. So I went down there and sat in, and I showed them my pictures of the car that I was looking to do. And they were kind of like, mm -hmm, yeah, right, OK. He bought a rust bucket. <laughs> But the thing was, is these were, a lot of these guys were engineers and whatnot, and they helped me along the way. So I was able to learn what it was that I needed to do to be able to put this car together. Um, it took me about three years to do it, and this is the end result. This is the EV GT40. It'll do 0 to 60 in under 5 seconds. It's got 130 mile per hour, uh, 130 mile per hour top end, and it's got about 120 mile range on it. Okay. This was one guy working in his garage where I had no previous experience with building cars. But I just had the desire to do it. That's fast car people. It's not about a golf cart. It's about building fast cars. It's new technology. Like I said, I'm the host of Car Show Television. I go out and I see all kinds of muscle cars every single weekend. I love those cars. It's a, they do something to my emotions, okay? But the reality is that it's time to move on to a new technology. And electric cars are fast, and they're, they'll pin you in the seat, number one, when you go out on them. They're quiet. They don't emit, um, emit the CO2s that, and the uh, molecules that the gentleman just spoke about. It's just the right way to go. 
The other thing is, is as I look at it, is we're also sending our young people overseas to defend oil in places that don't like us, just simply so that we can continue to keep the oil coming into this country. So it's time for the change. Electric cars have actually been around a long time. This was a 1917 Detroit electric car, okay? The first cars that were actually out on the road were electric cars. The problem that you get into with electric cars, though, is that this car had maybe about a 20-mile range in it. By the way, this picture was taken in, um, in Lakeland, Florida, about two weeks ago at the Lake Mirror uh, Concorde de Elegance. Uh, this car drove in and it drove out. <laughs> same electric motor it had when it originally was built, still running, same electronics in it. The only thing that's changed is the batteries. The problem we get into is that batteries are the problem. In electric cars, that's still the Achilles tendon to the whole thing. And that's what is the, is the problem. Well, the reason why gas engines came in and took over was because this car couldn't go far enough. Particularly at the time, their infrastructure, back in 1917, they didn't have the electric infrastructure that we have now to be able to plug them in all over the place. So it was a kind of a problem. That's why the gas cars took over and they kind of went to the wayside. <laughs> GM got into the game again back in 1966. So back in the 1960s, GM was actually looking at electric cars. They built something called the Electro Bear. It was based on the Corvair. I don't think anybody remembers the Corvair. Uh, uh, you know, there was a guy out there that said it was the worst car um, ever, but the reality was that's uh, uh, Ralph Nader. But the reality is the car was as safe as any of the other cars at the time. Um, by the way, one of the problems it would have is that it would um, is the handling on it wasn't so good. Um, as an electric car, the funny thing is you can move the batteries around so the weight is better. This car was actually quite successful for them, but they didn't carry on with the project because the battery pack was too expensive. That was the reason at the time. And uh, this one had about a 60 to 80 mile range in it. Well, my company, High Voltage High Rides, we came in uh, last year and we built the Electro Bear 3. Uh, this was done for an engineering, uh, an electrical engineer that uh, wanted to pay homage to the Electro Bear 2, and so we built this car. It'll do, uh, it's got about an 80 mile range on it. Uh, this car actually could probably do about 150 mile range, but the gentleman that we bought it, for, that we built it for, didn't really need it to go that far. So for him, an 80 mile range was double what he was looking to get out of it, um, and it cost him less. Again, the biggest problem here is that the most expensive part of the whole equation is the batteries. Back in the 1990s, uh, California actually passed some laws requiring the automakers to come in and make electric cars. Um, GM again got back in the game and they built the EV1. Now as part of this building of the EV1, they were looking at battery technologies. Now, the EV1 originally was built with lead-acid batteries. The problem with lead-acid batteries is they just don't have the energy density to really give you that much range. You're looking at probably between 60 to 80 miles, pretty much max, uh, with, with lead-acid. Some of them can go a little bit further, but the problem is the car is not really a car that you really want to drive. They built the EV1, and then they started looking at batteries. Well, around the same time, uh, a company had come out with nickel metal hydroxide batteries. This gave them the, en the energy density to actually be able to make a car that could do 150 miles. 150 mile car now starts really getting into the range where it's really useful. Unfortunately, the company that had that patent for those nickel metal hydroxide batteries basically bought into the idea with GM, sold part of their company to GM. GM ended up taking their part of the company and sold it to Texaco, which was then a week later bought it by Chevron. <laughs> Chevron basically put all kinds of restrictions on the batteries and really wouldn't allow any batteries larger than a laptop battery to be made. So all of the, all of the cars that had been previously had been worked out and the engineering had been done for nickel metal hydroxide batteries could no longer use them. But what drives the 
the need for better batteries is laptops and cell phones. Everybody wants to have your cell phone last longer, you want your laptop to last longer. That need has driven the battery industry. It wasn't the cars, it was the laptops and the cell phones. What ended up happening though, is the laptops and cell phones ended up, that desire to try to get better batteries, ended up coming up with a new chemistry called lithium ion. Now the really cool about the lithium ion, I'm not a chemist, so don't ask me about all the chemistry of those batteries. But what I can tell you is that there's a number of different ways to make them. And how those materials get bonded together, it's much harder to patent it. And because there was a number of different ways to make them, basically the cat was out of the bag. You know, we now have batteries that were, have very high energy density that we can start using in electric cars. The makers of the Tesla Motors realized this. And put together, basically, they, the first Tesla prototype was a string of laptop batteries that all got strung together. I think they had something like 5,000 of these little things all strung together. Um, so now they were able to be able to do theirs. The other thing was is that I also opened it up to people like me to also work with the lithium uh, ion batteries uh, to do it as well. Now, the big problem that we kind of got into is for the smaller guys is most of the companies that were actually out there producing these batteries were not opening it up to the smaller guys. They only wanted to make OEM orders of big, large amounts. Now, the reality is what I already showed you with John Wayland and his uh, white zombie is there's a lot of guys out there that are hot rodders, like myself, that like to race, like to make things go fast, and it's that, that's where the technology gets really developed. And so a lot of these battery companies were not allowing their batteries to be sold to us. Tesla has done a great job though. They, uh, I, I've got to hand it to Elon Musk. He has done a great job with the company. He's put his money where his mouth is and his belief in electric cars. And their battery pack now actually does 265 miles in the new Model S that comes out. That's pretty incredible because you're now talking about a car that almost goes as, fast, goes as far as a gas car. The Corvette only does 285 miles on a tank of gas. Now, still gets, gets into the problem with the batteries, and one of the things that the oil companies would all like you all to believe in is this thing called range anxiety, they call it. You're going to have range anxiety. You're going to be stuck on the side of the road with a dead battery. Okay, well, yeah, it could happen, but I actually helped the guy that ran out of gas the other day on the side of the road, too. So he was just as stuck as I would have been if I had had my batteries run out. But the thing is, is that we actually all have ways of being able to charge the cars. And the cars are getting, have longer and longer ranges, I just demonstrated here. But one of the things is, is that most people actually only drive less than 40 miles in a day. Even people that commute and may drive 30 miles to work, and 30 miles back are still driving less than 100 miles a day. Um, the only people that actually an electric car wouldn't really work for good for in their daily lives is maybe a traveling salesman that's literally in his car all day long. But the average person actually drives less than 25, 25 to 30 miles. You guys might all go home um, and as you spend the, your next week, push that little odometer in your car and see how many miles you actually drive in, in, a, in a day. And you'll find that it's probably a lot less than you think it is. Now, you still have things where you're actually going out and you're trying to travel longer. And if you're traveling further, then you get into um, problems, and you can go rent another vehicle. You all have your own personal <laughs> fuel station right there in your garage or in your house. You can actually plug into a 110 outlet and charge these cars. It'll take a while, but you can plug it into a 110 outlet and charge your car. Now, if you want it to charge a little bit faster, you go out and get an electrician, you have them put in a 220 outlet, just like you have like a dryer outlet. It's no big deal. You have them put it in, and you can now charge your car faster. Tesla, again, I, I, I gotta say I like these guys because they are one of the only companies out there that is an entirely electric company that's actually making it. And um, one of the things that they just demonstrated just recently was what they're actually doing was called battery swap, where literally, the battery's on the bottom of the car, they can drop the battery out, put up another battery, and 
and the car drives off. They actually demonstrated this working live on stage a few months ago. You can go to their website, you can check it out. They had two cars drive up on stage, change the batteries, drive off the stage at the same time while a guy is standing there pumping gas into his car. So range anxiety doesn't have to exist. If they put up systems like this along the roads, you basically can drive anywhere you can in a gas car. Now, what I want to propose here today, um, at the end of my talk here, is a problem that I see. And that is, I would like to list all of the battery companies and audio manufacturers to kind of look at this idea. And I'm putting it out there. And the thing that I've got a real problem with is old batteries. Most of these cars and stuff have proprietary batteries. How many people have a drawer somewhere in their house that you've got a half a dozen old cell phone batteries or laptop batteries that have all died and or cell phones that have died and you probably can't even find a battery for it anyway. <laughs> now imagine that as cars. Now the batteries in these cars do last a long time. They say they last probably about, the lithium ion or should last between eight to 10 years. But now remember, I'm a classic car guy. Okay, a lot of the cars that I go and see every day, every weekend, were made back in the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. Do we want all of our electric cars to end up in a junkyard? If they've got proprietary batteries, that you can't change out, then that's what's going to happen. So what I'm proposing is let's go back to this old system. It was a real good system we had as kids. We had, you know, had the A, the triple A's, the A's, the C's, the D's. We need to come up with some standards for electric cars. The same kind of thing. Obviously, they're going to be much larger than this. But we need to create non-standard, non or create standard non-proprietary um, sizes of batteries that can be used in EVs. I kind of put together just a few ideas to kind of start the thing out, looking at maybe three different models. One would be a flat pack that gets attached to the bottom of the car, similar to what's being used in the Model S. Again, we need to do, what we need to design is we need to work at looking at the design the case, so the case is standard and the voltage is standard. That way you can have the cars can be designed and the batteries can be designed. If the batteries come up with a better technology in five to ten years, you're not throwing out a car, you're basically putting that new battery technology in the same case and plugging it in. Just how your alkaline batteries were better than the old die, uh, heavy duty batteries that you had in the, in the toys as a kid. A second type would be uh, a large round cylinder that would get packed in either the back or the front. Something that could be stacked easily, and that's something that could be loaded in and out. This type probably wouldn't be uh, an on-the-fly uh, change like the flat packs, but would be used for more like utility vehicles that aren't necessarily going as far. And the final thing would be a large box pack that could be used in larger vehicles or vehicles where you're not having to change it out as much, but you need large amounts of energy. If we can develop three different kinds like this, then we're going to have something that as those cars get older and they become classic muscle cars later on, we can change out the batteries and keep them on the road. So that's my idea that hopefully we can spread. Thank you very much. <laughs>